Good morning and welcome to the 15th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2019. Uh, we have received apologies from David Stewart, MSP, and Miles Briggs, MSP, and Anas Sarwar is attending as a substitute for David Stewart. Can I ask everyone in the room to please ensure that mobile phones are switched off or on silent? and not to use mobile devices for photography or recording. The first item on the agenda is subordinate legislation consideration of a super affirmative instrument. The order is subject to the super affirmative procedure involving an additional stage of scrutiny, which is today where Parliament considers a proposal for a statutory instrument uh, before the instrument is formally laid. This procedure is used for instruments such as this one, which require a particularly high level of scrutiny. This. Uh, Today's session is in relation to the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman Healthcare Whistleblowing Order 2018 in draft. And we will take formal evidence on this proposed draft today. Uh, I should put on record that we did invite uh, Unison, John Stoddock QC and Sir Robert Francis uh, all to give evidence uh, today, but all for various reasons uh, were unable to attend. However, I'm delighted that we do have with us uh, Rosemary Agnew, Scottish Public Services Ombudsman, Rona Atkinson, non-executive director, uh, vice chair and whistleblowing champion at NHS Grampian. Alison Mitchell, uh, non-executive board member and whistleblowing champion at NHS Lothian. And Bob Matheson, head of advice and advocacy at Protect uh, the Whistleblowing Charity. So we'll now uh, move directly to questions. I'm uh, encouraging colleagues to uh, indicate and come in with questions through the chair uh, on aspects, any aspects that are raised uh, in the evidence uh, and look forward to hearing from the witness what uh, what the witnesses have to say. Clearly, it's an important step, an important order and important to get it right. Uh, and uh, while it's been understood for some time that the independent national whistleblowing officer would be located within the uh, purview of the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman, I think the decision that the, the two persons, the two roles should be held by the same person uh, is perhaps uh, uh, not something that was quite as widely anticipated. So uh, can I start by asking all of the witnesses, uh, uh, but including, of course, uh, the Ombudsman, um, what their view is of, the, uh, of this proposal and of the benefits or disbenefits of the, say, the, this, the, the, the two roles being carried out by the same person. Who would like to start? Would you like me to start? It seems a logical place it does to indeed. start. Um, I think it's worth remembering and reflecting on why it's the same person and that was in response to government consultation and it was a response to that consultation that uh, suggested the Ombudsman because of uh, our independence. Um, I say our because I think of myself and my whole office. We all deliver the service. We're independent. We have... Um, a, a track record and a lot of knowledge about complaint handling and I fully accept and we all understand that whistleblowing is not exactly the same as complaint handling. There are some significant differences but some of the underlying skills that you will, we will need when uh, being involved in investigating and setting the standards are already there so we were able to hit the ground running. In terms of it being the same person uh, the challenges that that will present to me uh, within the organisation are to ensure that whilst I, as an individual, um, have both of those duties and areas of responsibility, I must ensure that our processes, that our internal approaches, recognise the difference, particularly when it comes to confidentiality, because there may be occasions where we're investigating complaints about an organisation at the same time as we are looking at whistleblowing issues. On the whole, though, I think that the benefits uh, completely outweigh any of those procedural issues. The important thing is we recognise them. Um, for me, it is the independence, the ability to scrutinise, um, the ability, bearing in mind that this order builds on powers that I already have, uh, it's the ability to shine a light on things, to encourage learning, to encourage engagement, and I think the opportunity to try and develop and contribute to a national culture where openness and trust 
are the norm as opposed to having to rely on a process bolted on at the end, if you like. Um, and I'll stop there and let some of my esteemed colleagues um, have their say. Okay. Um, I would concur with what you've just heard. The two roles in one holds no disadvantages, I think, for the NHS, but it does hold significant benefits. There are distinct differences between complaints and whistleblowing. One escalates to become a whistleblowing, obviously might actually also cover some aspects that would not be part of a complaint. So my experience of the Ombudsman in handling complaints within the NHS is that when you do have to go to that level, you do get conclusion, but you also get very positive feedback about how you can learn for the future. So I think if we could tap into the experience that the existing Ombudsman staff have and relate that to the specifics around whistleblowing and complaints around the situations that may lead to whistleblowing within the NHS, then there is great benefit to be had by all. I don't think we can underestimate the experience that these people have and the learning that we can take from them. Very much. Alice Mitchell, would you like Thank to? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I agree with my colleagues here. I would say that it's absolutely imperative that there is an independence, and the Ombudsman brings that in, in great, great uh, quantity. Um, the, the distinction, though, between whistleblowing and complaints is really important, and therefore the definition uh, of what is deemed whistleblowing is also important if, this, if the Ombudsman's role is to be effective. There can often be conflation between whistleblowing matters of public interest or, or patient safety with personal grievance. And it's very important to understand what, what area the Ombudsman would actually be uh, covering in terms of their, their jurisdiction. Um, I'm very content that the skills they bring, the advice, the support they give in terms of complaint handling has, has been all, nothing but beneficial to the NHS, in my view. And I do believe they'll bring that core skill set. However, I do have certain concerns when I start to read about model procedures and efficiency. Um, these, these things are important, but culturally, um, whistleblowing issues tend to be somewhat different from standard complaints or factual operational complaints. And they, by their nature, are pretty comprehensive. So when we talk about efficiency, when reference is made to that, I, I'm concerned because the most important thing about investigating whistleblowing complaints is that they are done thoroughly and appropriately, sensitively in many cases, and by the right people. And those kind of investigations can take time. And it can take time to identify appropriate individuals to undertake these investigations, sometimes having to be drawn in from outside the organisation because of the nature of the issue under scrutiny. So taking that in hand and, and taking account of that, I, I see no reason why whatsoever why this should not sit very comfortably with the Ombudsman. Thank you very much. Bob Matson. Um, as a, as a, maybe a small bit of background for the committee members that aren't um, aware of Protect or know our work, uh, we're a whistleblowing charity, and so that, that's the, the thing that we specialise in and are expert in, and we're based down in London, but are UK-wide. Um, and because I think we speak to an awful lot of whistleblowers, and I speak to a lot of whistleblowers as my day-to-day -day job, I'm very fortunate to perhaps to understand the nuances in being able to deal with these sorts of problems. And if there's an obvious issue or, or challenge with placing... Uh, the inwo inside of SPSO it is this distinction, I think, between complaints and whistleblowing, um, which for a very, very long time have been, uh, th there has been a clear difference seen between them. A and and w what I would kind of add to what's already said around that is, is the big difference is really the position of the, in of the person that's reaching out to the oversight body. So in a complaint, you are very much the person affected ordinarily. Something's happened with your care or with the health treatment that you've received whereas the ordinary place of the whistleblower is as the witness and that's a really really important distinction and whilst obviously the inwo will be playing a role in looking at how the whistleblower has been treated and in that sense they're complaining about what's happened to them I think it's really really important that we don't lose sight of the whistleblowers as the witness and the concern as the focus of what we're trying to achieve here because ultimately whilst we want to make sure that whistleblowers are safe in the health service we also really want to make sure that the concerns that they're raising are heard and listened to. Um, and so the, the, the main difference that comes out of that really is expectations around what can be expected as part of the investigation process from a kind of complainant in a complaints process and a whistleblower. 
There's different rights for the different sorts of gr groups, different sorts of redress, things like that. So that's the obvious challenge. Um, uh, I, I don't think that it's insurmountable at all, and I think the SPSO has already done um, lots and lots of work and think about how they can adapt their processes to make sure um, that they uh, uh, can meet the needs of whistleblowing, which is quite dif different from complaints. And I think so long as that's an ongoing process and there's training for their staff to make that adjustment um, and there's uh, on ongoing stakeholder engagement, I don't see that being too big of a problem. And I think certainly when you look at the advantages of placing it in this organisation, uh, personally and from, from our organisation's perspective, um, uh, the, the pros definitely outweigh the cons. You know, I think the fact that it's an established organisation and with processes already in place, staff that are already there, it's going to be much quicker to get it off the ground and of course it's trusted and, and seen to be independent. Thank you very much. The, the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh was one of the respondents to our, our consultation on, the, on this order who said that there's a concern that the uh, intended potency of the independent whistleblowing officer could be lost and merely absorbed into a multitude of other functions. And there is a question clearly for the SPSO of, of being able to accommodate what is a very significant new set of responsibilities within already existing uh, very significant sets of responsibilities. Can I just uh, ask you to confirm or to respond to the Royal College's concern uh, and, and, and explain how you intend to address that going forward? Um, I'm just firstly just like to say how grateful we are to everybody who's responded to this and to our own consultation on the standards, um, the draft standards we've put out. I, I completely understand and um, can appreciate why there may be concern about whistleblowing is not complaint handling. And we haven't lost or ignored that point all the way through the development of the standards, our um, collaboration, our talking to multitude of stakeholders. And I think the best assurance I can give is that we're not looking at currently um, in terms of our own function and structure of absorbing whistleblowing um, complaints as they're referred to within our general workload. We're actually looking at a specific team who are there to handle whistleblowing concerns because there are a number of things immediately that strike me as being the significant differences and it picks up on some of the points um, that were made here. The first is that one of the most significant differences between a complaint about service and something that is escalated from raising a whistleblowing concern is that there are likely to be one or two things at the core of these coming to us. One is patient safety in the public interest and the other is the treatment of the individual and these can't wait. They have to be addressed relatively quickly and picking up on your point about the witness, I think what people have to say, actually physically say, is equally important. And what that is leading our thinking on, subject to all the responses we get into the consultation, is that we will have a, a different approach for this team in terms of how we try and address these concerns, partly to address them thoroughly, partly to ensure that learning is picked up and fed back, um, but also to try and ensure that something happens quickly. You know, if there is a patient safety issue, it shouldn't necessarily have to wait all the way through an investigative process if it's something that should have been, obviously should have been put right straight away. So whilst I can't say definitively we're going to do X, Y, Z, I hope that by sharing our current thinking with you about how we see this being part of the organisation gives some reassurance. It does, however, um, raise one of my con major concerns, and that is about resourcing. And when I talk about resourcing, I'm not just talking about the SPSO, it's actually the NHS itself. Because if this is going to work as it's envisaged, if it's going to contribute to more robust governance, to open and trusting 
cultures where people are confident to raise concerns long before it becomes called whistleblowing, where it's just part of your everyday work, then it has to be adequately resourced to ensure that investigations can happen quickly where they're raised. So I, I, I'd like to put this down as a marker that I think it's one of the success factors that both the NHS themselves and the SPSO are adequately resourced to be able to deliver this service in the way the policy um, and the, the order envisage it. Thanks very much. Emma Harper. Just on the back of that, and thank you, Convener. Good morning, everybody. It, it, what level of funding has been projected or estimated that would be required for, for this uh, the NWO role? We haven't currently um, come to a, a figure. We're still in the planning stage within our own office, and it's something that is part of the ongoing programme with, with government to discuss at some point. Um, our, our um, relationship with the, the development of the policy and government up to now has been very positive, um, but I think part of the reason I raised the point is not necessarily because there is an issue, it's the fact it's a success factor, but it's not just about the SPSO, it's also about the NHS. Just... <coughs> The funding, would it come from the government then, or would it come from like NHS pathway funding? Um, I would expect it to come from the government. Where the government divert it from, bring it from, um, I think is a matter for them. Okay. And is it a matter NHS boards are cited on? Uh, Alison Mitchell. It's something that we are very concerned about um, in putting together NHS Lothian's new policy procedure and investigative process. It's very clear, particularly when these issues tend by their nature to be quite complex, the time, the management time to do this comprehensively and appropriately properly um, is very significant. These managers are people who are pulled in to do the investigation that have full-time day jobs. They're NHS you know, under huge pressure, delivering against a series of other targets. And they want to engage, and it has to come as, as, as far as possible from within the organisation, because this is about uh, encouraging a culture change. It's about the organisation listening to the individual, not some outside organisation imposing that listening upon the organisation. So we, I think, you know, it would be concerned that there isn't, you know, if we have been held to targets and certain model procedures, how can that be delivered alongside the data without additional resource? NHS Lothian just very recently has gone beyond policy and procedure because the organisation feels that this is a culture change, it's not a process, it's not a transactional thing to, to hear whistleblowing concerns. And NHS Lothian has just recently appointed two um, Speak Up ambassadors and is about to support those ambassadors with a network of Speak Up advocates of about 20 individuals across the organisation to support whistleblowers to encourage whistleblowers and to ensure that they have the proper support and treatment you know throughout any whistleblowing process but that is you know again these people have been taken from day jobs and this is additional work so I think everyone needs to be aware of just what that if we're going to commit to this and do it properly this isn't a box ticking exercise this is a real commitment and passion to ensure that we, we create a, 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 an environment where concerns can be raised freely and without fear for, for the benefit of all. Rona Atkinson. And similarly, in Grampian, um, in taking forward the whistleblowing champion's role, we've tried to look at two things, and that is, should something have got to the extent that it becomes a complaint, serious complaint and or whistleblowing, then whoever makes that stance is fully protected and they have a process to go through to allow them to get to conclusion. But in parallel to that, we are trying very hard to look at not getting to that extent. And that, I think, is where the resource really needs to go. Um, we're looking at different forms of mentoring and support, listening skills, how you handle complaints when they come towards you, um, and actually putting your hand up as a manager and asking for help to do those kind of things. Because everybody is under a great deal of pressure on the front line. And there will be slip-ups, and there will probably be more slip-ups. 
unintended, but they will escalate. But it's finding space to allow people, almost like a duty of candour in the staffing cohort, to say, we need time out to look at this, discuss it, and get to a better place to stop it escalating. So we're trying very hard in Grampian to take it down both <coughs> routes. We appreciate that some will not be resolved that way, and rightly so, and they will escalate on to being either more serious complaints and if we're really unlucky to whistleblowing. So we, we're trying to push both sets of processes through. It's a huge cultural change. And, and with resource implications again. Yeah. 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 Uh, Rosemary, and then I'll come back to Bob. Thank you. I just wanted to pick up two points, really. One was um, really echoing um, what you're saying, Rona, and that is one of the significant differences between the whistleblowing standards that we're currently consulting on and the complaint, service complaint handling, is that they explicitly and deliberately recognise that whistleblowing, formally whistleblowing, is actually not the beginning of the process. That the, the probably more important bit is what we refer to as business as usual, where if you have any form of concerns, this is where the culture change needs to be. You just raise them as part of your job, your everyday work. And, and that is really where the concept of efficiency, if you like, comes in. It's not efficiency as in pound notes. It's as in picking up things early, um, developing a, an, an environment of trust and confidence, of getting the right outcome in relation to patient safety at the earliest possible time. The other point I'd just like to pick up as well is the time scales one, um, because there's perhaps something lost in translation. The model or standard procedures that we're uh, consulting on do have timescales attached to them, but they're not absolute targets, as in you're held to account if you don't meet them. They are there as these are the expected, but if there is a situation where you need to extend them, then you extend them as long as there are good reasons for it. And the reason we've included this is not to try and impose something unrealistic, but to ensure that within the process, things keep moving. And that's something we've learned from complaint handling. So understand entirely the concerns. And if there is a way that you think we could articulate that better, I'd be very happy to discuss that. Thank you. I always think committees work well when we have negotiation in public. Uh, Bob Matson. <coughs> so I think firstly, maybe just to pick up on this what is whistleblowing point, which is really central to all of this. Um, and certainly the standards that I've seen don't envisage whistleblowing as, as just that final escalation point up to an outside body, that they see whistleblowing as raising concerns with your organisation as well. And certainly the vast, vast majority of people I advise never go beyond raising their concerns with their line manager, or they might escalate it up to a senior manager. You know, And that's the norm, that's what's happening in the main, and these people are still suffering. So um, I, I think that is important when we're considering... Um, just in, in the kind of wider perspective of, of what this all is about uh, and also in terms of funding. Because what I would go on to say is that whilst um, I would absolutely support calls certainly for the SPSO to receive the funding that it needs, and I think it probably is going to need quite a lot of funding to do this role, which is a really big role, and I would certainly support um, the NHS receiving more money to be able to do this. Um, it's also important to recognise that what we're asking organisations to do here is what they should already be doing. And I think also it's what the public expects them to do. What we're looking for is just when people raise concerns with them about people getting hurt or about risks that they're listened to um, properly and dealt with um, quickly and that those people aren't targeted as a result. We're not actually asking the organisation really to do much more different. There's a bit more admin maybe involved in it. What we're introducing, as I see it, is someone to oversee that process and to make sure that they are doing it properly. So yes, I would absolutely support the call for more funding, but I think it's also to put it um, into the perspective of th this isn't a cherry on top for uh, the health service in Scotland. Th this is, is what we should be expecting them to do anyway, um, and it's just important, I think, that we have someone to help and support and oversee them doing it to make sure that they are doing it. Thank you very much. Um, can I bring in Brian Whittle, and then I'm sure we can have some further discussion around these questions. Brian yeah, Thank you, Kibina. Good morning to the panel. I think um, the approach uh, around definition of what we're, or how we're defining what constitutes uh, whistleblowing is, is going to be within the, the, the complaints handling procedure rather within the order itself. 
Um, and I wondered whether you cons when you consideration you're given to whether the le there should be legislative oversight uh, of that of that definition. Should it sit within the order? So the, it's it's in the standards, but it's not in the order. That's the point, isn't it? So yeah. You've, you've hit upon the second of my concerns. Um, I'm comfortable personally in myself and my organisation. Um, that we have understood and defined whistleblowing and I'm comfortable by the fact that this is the result of a lot of collaboration and co-production. What I'm not comfortable with is that it sits somewhere where it is entirely down to the Ombudsman, not because I, I don't feel we can do this, but there isn't the same level of scrutiny that there would be if it were in something or a, an instrument that has parliamentary oversight. And there are two ways that um, we think this can be done. Um, the obvious way is to actually include in the order a non-exhaustive definition. So one that, a bit like the one in our standards, um, doesn't restrict you to exactly one specific thing, but, but gives you a good definition that you can work with um, and is relatively flexible. Uh, in light of experience. The other place that we think it could go, if not in legislation, is actually in the principles that we are required to lay before Parliament. And this is part of my wider SPSO powers. I have to lay complaint handling principles, and this will include laying the whistleblowing um, complaint principles as well. Um, and that is another area where um, Obviously, it's down to government, but if it were not in the legislation itself, um, where it could be, because that, again, goes before Parliament and would have an element of, of scrutiny in public, too. So, yes, it's it's a concern for me that it's it's within the areas of, of drafting that are purely down to the SPSO at the moment. Yeah. Uh, do, do other witnesses have a view? Clearly, it's... It's, it would one must assume be legally competent, but the question of whether it's the appropriate mechanism, I guess, is there. Does anyone have a view? No, Brian, did you want to follow up? Yeah, I, mean, I, just, I just, I mean, just to echo, I think that the issue of, of presenting legislation without defining specifically about what the legislation is, is, is pertaining to, I think, is, is as you've alluded to, I think, is, is an issue. And I also think with with it that there's there's this legislation is, is dependent on, on, on third parties who are not subject to parliamentary scrutiny. Uh, and I wondered whether you had any other examples uh, where that's the case, whether this is fairly unique. It's a very fair question. It may be that it's one for the Cabinet Secretary later, but I, I don't know if Rosemary Agnew is aware of any other cases where definitions of, of matters of effectively matters of law are, are left um, out with the legislation and left to the... I, I can't think of any, but no. it's a it's a question that I'd like to take away and come back to you on, if okay. I may. I think we may come back to it later in, in, in the session as well. Um, thank you very much. Now, I think Sandra had a brief supplementary, and then Emma, and then I'll come to Alex. Uh, thank you very much, Sharon. Before I do my brief supplementary, can I declare an interest as a member of the Scottish Parliament corporate body? Uh, there's two small issues I wanted to raise. Um, Rosemary... Agony, you mentioned about the time scales and it's extensive and I picked up on a point, I may be wrong, but I wondered if you're talking about if it's a difficult case, there's no cut-off point when you're investigating, is, is that correct or will there be a cut-off point? Um, I think the time scales, the time scales we were um, referring to are for the, the NHS in terms of how long they take. There is provision within this that if an individual feels that something is taking too long, they can come directly to us and say, I raised this and it doesn't seem to be moving, nothing much is happening. Um, then people can come to us before that. Um, so to an extent, it's within the gift of the individual if they feel it's taking too long. But I, I think from my experience of complaints, as long as there is not huge impact that needs addressing straight away, a thorough investigation where the organisation concerned are learning for themselves, are maybe identifying deeper issues, other things that are sitting around this, that is the best place for the learning to be. And it's not that I'm trying to do us out of work, 
but I would much rather be providing the support on how to do good investigations than having to put resource into picking it up at the final stage. Okay, so Chair, I just, it's all right if I ask Mr Matheson in regards to that, you're quite right, I hadn't heard of your organisation, I apologise for that, uh, basically, and I welcome your comments. How many cases have you actually, your organisation, have they picked up cases, i.e. from Scottish Parliament and various other guises or the NHS? Yeah, so I mean, in terms of how many cases, um, it's about 3,000 individuals that come to us for advice uh, each year. They're not all what we would see as whistleblowers or directly within our remit, um, but the, the vast majority are. Um, in terms of the cases that we have in Scotland, we have for quite some time now run NHS Scotland's advice line for um, the, the health service. So we, so we get an awful lot of cases through that and, and, and are quite experienced in advising those sorts of individuals. It, thank you. I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. It's just a wee sup about the definition of whistleblowing because the whole process, and I declare an interest as a former clinical educator and nurse in NHS of Reason Galloway, who used to look at issues around like central line infections, for instance, or things like that, and patterns in care or, or behaviours or whatever. So the, the whole process is about escalating concerns or addressing concerns, and most of it will be dealt with in a business-as-usual manner. And it's when we're looking at somebody that might feel under, I don't know, threat not losing their job necessarily, but from intimidation processes. So this whole issue is about a step process where the whistleblower would be the final part of maybe something that could have been dealt with if leadership processes had been better. And I know the Cabinet Secretary has talked about changing the whole culture in order to address processes where you don't need the whistleblower in the first place. So. The, the definition is, should allow us to be flexible in the approach because many of the cases or presentations will be quite varied. So I, I wouldn't suggest that we would need to lock down a really tight definition of what is whistleblowing. Is, is that what, what yeah, is, up, is appropriate, I, I would right. say? Yeah, I, th I think that's what we mean by... Um, wanting a non-exhaustive definition. So um, if you look at the definition that we've actually put in the draft standards, it covers a number of things, but quite clearly says it is non-exhaustive, because there's all, always something that comes from left of field that doesn't get covered in specific wording, but actually within a general definition. I think the other reason why a definition of what is whistleblowing and raising a concern is important is very often whistleblowing and whistleblower get conflated. And whistleblowing is a very specific thing where an individual has chosen, for whatever reason, to make it part of a more formal process that gives them the protections that whistleblowing brings. Um, so, in a way, a lot of this comes from this non-exhaustive definition. Um, but I, I agree entirely, it, it shouldn't lock us down to the point that it restricts other things being able to be brought into it. I'll call that. Oh, sorry, yes. Sorry, as, a, as a tiny um, addition to that, and I mean, this is pr probably just repeating a little bit what I said before, but, but it is very, very important that we don't cut out from what we see as whistleblowing that day-to-day -day activity. Because what's very common in the people that I speak to um, is they won't realise that they are quote-unquote whistleblowing. They will have some concerns, they will speak to their line manager, and then all hell will break loose. And they might never say anything again because they're sufficiently scared of doing anything else that they then be quiet. That sort of situation, we absolutely have to have the INWO looking at. I mean, it would completely undermine its purpose if we said, well, they weren't doing that formally, well, they weren't calling it whistleblowing, and because of that reason, we, we can't treat it under the process. So, so I really think we need to be careful not to cut out the business-as-usual stuff, which actually is just as much whistleblowing as escalating it somewhere external. Rona Atkins. Yeah. On the, the question of, of definition, you almost have to turn it on its head. If you give a very tight definition, it will become too easy to measure any negativity against the definition as opposed to looking at negativity in its own right. 
So you would use it to interpret, is that whistleblowing as opposed to, is that not a good situation by looking at the situation and doing something about it? So you almost stop things being taken the full course of resolution if you put in too tight a definition. Okay, yeah, that point's understood. Alec Colhampton. Mbini, good morning to the panel. Thank you for coming to see us today. Uh, policy change is only as ever, ever as good as the difference it brings about. Um, and this committee and other stakeholders in the health community are still reeling from the revelations of the Sturrock Review into NHS Highland and, and the bullying and systemic problems there. Now, I recognise uh, what you said, Rosemary Agnew, about um, whistleblowing not being a replacement for normal grievance procedure. And much of the Sturrock Review revelations are around the handling of grievances and, and uh, inter-staff relationships, but some of it is systemic as well. So can I ask you, do you think that um, had this policy change been in effect prior to the revelations about NHS Highland, that things might have been different or been handled differently? That's, there's always the answer, yes, probably. Um, I, I think it's difficult to say yes, definitely. I think the opportunity to handle it differently would have been there because there would have been much more focus on um, integrating this with um, governance, with HR procedures, with um, the way the organisation is run and encourages at every level. And I, I concur with some of the points that some of this is, it's not about management. This is just about how you as a team may operate um, it, it, as well as how you relate to the organisation you're in. I think where it would have strengthened and perhaps averted things is it would have come out into the open a lot, a lot sooner because one of the things that the, um, the approach that we're taking recognises is that there are occasions where, as business as usual, you may have a concern over something. And is it grievance or is it whistleblowing? I think one of the challenges we all have is whistleblowing is not particularly well recorded at the moment. So what it would have given individuals more... Um, empowerment to do is to actually say no I want this to be recognized as whistleblowing or I want this to be recognized as a grievance against individuals um, but it also gives them the safety net of if the organization had decided to go down one route when they thought it should be the other they could actually come to the inwo to say we think this is more suitable to either a grievance or to whistleblowing. And the, the issue of bullying and harassment is, is a really interesting one in the context of whistleblowing because it's, it's one of the areas, I think, where I've heard a lot of concerns raised about um, are you going to stray into human resources policy territory because, no, we're not. And bullying is probably a good example of, of how that might work in practice. You could, as an individual, say, I am being bullied by X. That is a grievance, I would suggest, against an individual. But if you were to say there is a pervasive culture of bullying in this organisation that means I am afraid to speak up with things that I see are wrong, that is whistleblowing. So at the outset, it's important to explore just what the individual is trying to raise and to fully understand it. The other place where it may raise itself is at the other end of the process, where it's the treatment of the individual. I raise these issues and I now feel I'm the subject of bullying and harassment. And I think in that context, if you reflect on the out uh, output of the Sturrock report, what you see is that there is more safeguard earlier on but equally a recognition that within those safeguards, you also have to dovetail this with good bullying and harassment policies, with wider organisational um, approaches to how you develop your organisation. So whilst I can't say that it would have changed anything, what I think I can say with a degree of confidence is that it is likely to have been different or have been escalated quicker. Can I thank you for that? Can I unpack that uh, still further with you? Um, you give several examples of how it stops being a grievance issue and is a recognition of the culture. Um, 
my concern, and, and I hope that this would be dealt with by this, uh, the, the way we're going to do things differently, and perhaps you can clarify that. Um, my concern is for those staff who don't have any faith in the HR processes of their health board or their uh, locale um, because of a culture, um, and maybe it's linked, maybe they, they started getting bullied because they started asking questions or they started raising concerns about it, or the bullying came first and the, the, you know, the bullies are in the strata of the processes that they are expected to complain through. Is there an opportunity for those people to circumvent local processes and go straight to you or, or, or the whistleblowing function? Um, and if that is the case, how can we get that message out to staff so that they feel confident that if, if things are so bad in their locality, that they can circumvent. Rosemary Agnew. All right, I'll try and unpick that one. Um, I think that the short answer is yes, there is provision in there that says, although this is the process you are expected to go through, um, whereby the organize, you raise it with the organisation and there's a two-stage where they will try and resolve it or investigate it in detail. There is also a recognition that for some people, this may not be ideal for them. So they would have the opportunity of contacting us directly. Um, now, we may at that point, and this is where I think it's very case dependent, and it's very dependent on the individual or group of individuals, um, we could do a number of things. We could theoretically look at it ourselves from the beginning. We could raise it with the organisation and say, you should be looking at this. And having done that, that would give a very different level of expectation, I think, because the organisation would be very clear that they're under the, under the spotlight here. But the important thing is that there, are more, there is more than one route. The other uh, thing that this raises, and to an extent this comes back to resources as well, it's really important that organisations put time, and they will have support from us, into awareness and training of how concerns can be discussed, both as business as usual and uh, as under the whistleblowing procedures, that everybody is aware of how to signpost. So if you're a line manager, how you signpost and advise um, what somebody can do. Um, and if without that awareness, you run the risk of isolation of I don't know where to go. So there are two things in there. One is building trust in the system, which can only be done, I think, through showing it works um, and the reassurances. But also the other is about ensuring that people are familiar with where and what they can do. And it's why organisations like Protect, who also give advice, and why our own advice function um, would pick those issues up. Can I add to that? Uh, NHS Lothian being one of the larger boards in Scotland, you know, up to 26,000 uh, people. Um, it's multi-site. In fact, you, you, although we have an underlying culture and values, <coughs> every site has a different culture, a different feel. You know, pe people um, have different uh, management systems, different tiers of management, wherever they are and wherever they're disciplined. So one of the reasons that when I heard some feedback after investigations ceased for whistleblowers, they told me that they didn't know where to go. They didn't know, they couldn't complain within the unit because it involved the people they were working with, for instance, and they needed someone to tell them and they had no way of understanding. So this is what we're trying to address in terms of appointing guardians and advocates. It's about an education. There's a massive communication exercise about to commence at NHS Lothian so that people who don't have access to online systems, for instance, many of our people don't have computer terminals or computer access, have somewhere to go, somewhere to find out this information. And it, uh, uh, as the Ombudsman has said, it's, it is about raising the awareness and the culture change will take time. Trust takes time to build. Mm. And we know people will be sceptical and reticent, and we hope eventually that this will be completely superfluous. We won't need whistleblowing champions. We won't need the ombudsman to interfere because it will become second nature. But NHS Lothian has recognised that having a policy alone with named contacts, so we, you, know, you can 
but if you can access that policy or you know it exists, that's a start. So there's this huge educational um, initiative. Um, NHS OD also has a mediation service to try and you know resolve grievances at the lowest level. We're trying at the moment to do things informally to have staff speak up at local level and address it at local level, not formally reporting it, just dealing with it and be seen to be dealing with it. And that builds the trust in the culture. But there's a huge learning curve for all involved. And uh, I would say that we just need to give this time and the investment, the commitment uh, from the top. It has to be a leadership driven exercise. It can't be imposed upon an organisation. Yeah. And I think the organisation has to learn for itself. I think that point was very, very valid. It's not about someone else coming and telling you how to do this. It's about you finding out where you've gone wrong and putting it right within the organisation. Thank you very much. Anna Sarra. Good morning. I just wanted to follow up on Alison Mitchell's point about the trust and culture. I think that's a really important point. And I, I take what Rosemary Agnew said around having the right framework, having the right structures, having the guardians, having the champions. But we've also got to live in the real world. And in the real world, there are st NHS staff being bullied every single day in every health board, probably in every hospital and almost every setting across the country. And unless you change the culture where you've got lots of busy people doing lots of work with more and more pressure, with less and less resource, with more and more demand, you know, you can have the best process in the world, you're still going to have people getting bullied every day and not having somewhere to turn. How do we change that culture? Again, that's about empowerment and being sure that people have the have the confidence to speak up and know it will be carried out. And it's something we have to build. Like we can't just say, this is now the culture. We're going to listen to you. We have to be seen to listen, and not just listen, but act. So it's reflecting back, and it's about giving someone at every level, someone else to, to speak to, a safe space. You know, it's often, it's a term often used. It's the isolation. When you're working in a very large organisation, it can be very isolating. You, you don't know where to turn. Smaller organisations are, are, tend to be somewhat more collegiate. But we have units which are out in the middle of nowhere, but they're very tight-knit. But if there's a bullying, you know, if there's some individuals there, leadership where there's bullying going on, um, we might not see it at centre. So my worry as a non-executive whistleblowing champion is what don't I know? What don't I see? Mm -hmm. And it's about trying to get as many people out there to be the eyes and ears and the ambassador's role is to go out and just have conversation, not to go into problem areas, but just go out and speak to staff and hear, you know, how they feel about their current culture. And we're constantly embedding values and training. We've rolled out huge amounts of training for whistleblowing process and policy. But I, this is why I feel quite passionate about moving beyond this process and policy. It's all about culture. You know, box ticking, having a process and a policy in place does not achieve the goal. It is about the way we actually enact that on the ground. L let me give you a few practical examples. There's just a few cases that I'm currently dealing with, for example. One, a consultant uh, who uh, raises concerns around uh, how some patients are treated and how uh, what kind of uh, resources is used or material is used in individual operations. <coughs> He's viewed as being a troublemaker. Three other consultants in that same ward gang up on them and say, actually, we need to reduce your hours. It's your clinical practice that's in doubt, not our clinical practice. He's not going to become a whistleblowing champion because he's not going to get career progression. He's going to get his hours reduced. He has had his hours reduced and he's now actively trying to find a job somewhere outside Scotland's <coughs> NHS. He's not going to become a whistleblowing champion because his seniors aren't going to support him. The GP, for example who raises concerns around resources at an area where there is higher deprivation, higher demand, agitates with other GPs. They're told, actually, let's look around your own registration, let's look around your own background, let's find examples of where you have got it wrong and open up investigations about how you operate your own GP practice. They're not going to become a whistleblowing champion. They're not going to turn to someone. Where are they going to go? A nurse who raises concerns around <clears throat> too much pressure on her Again, her seniors are telling her, look, we're all under increasing pressure. What are we going to do? There, there is nowhere to go. All these situations aren't going to be resolved by having a whistleblowing champion. How do you, how do you change that culture? It's about the, the listening properly and being seen to hear. So it's about perhaps having the issue raised at the right level. If it's raised locally amongst others who are blocking it, it's this identifying barriers 
We're undertaking quite a significant exercise at the moment to identify what the barriers to speaking up are. What is it that makes people uncomfortable? And the most common reasons are fear for career progression or you know, direct bullying. And until it can be seen to be done that someone who's raised a valid concern has been fully investigated. I've actually had a whistle, whistleblowing case where the individual very genuinely raised concerns about a situation and very validly raised concerns. It was investigated and when it was investigated there were very many technical dimensions but it wasn't found actually to be a flawed or a serious issue. But the, the secret there was to give the whistleblower the feedback and the full explanation as to why something was as it was and was not being changed. And then speaking when the investigation was closed, because I don't get involved at all during any investigation process, the individual said, well, I accept that, now I understand, but to me it looked like X, Y or Z. So this person felt that it had been taken seriously. The, the outcome wasn't any different, but they understood what had happened and why. And I think that's, it's that kind of feedback, that acceptance, but that, again, takes time. Every single whistleblower will have to have um, this kind of feedback explanation. And at the moment, the processes that we have in place aren't doing that, and that hence the fact we've, we've appointed these ambassadors and, and advocates so that they can... It's not to represent the individual, it's not a representative role, but it's an advocacy, a support, a... Uh, a signposting someone else to go and listen to an external organisation, perhaps, who could go to the Royal College or, or whatever, signposting appropriately and giving the support they need. But you're quite right, this is just, this is the start of a process. It's, it's going to be organic, it's not going to happen overnight. But if, we, if it's driven from the top and if it's driven from all quarters, it will grow, it will seed and it will grow. Rose, Rosemary Agnew, and, and, and recognising the critical importance of culture here, but also wh whether the powers within the order are adequate to allow you and others to address that culture is, is, is central to our consideration. Um, I, I think I'll s start really echoing um, what between us we said, is that this, as a process, is only part of it. The whistleblowing, the creation of the inwo, the order is only part of something wider. And of itself, this will not address bullying and harassment. But what this will address in a different way is um, the consequences for individuals. So that the question that was coming through my, my mind when you were speaking is, why is there so little faith in the system that people can't speak out? And actually, if you address why there is so little faith, you probably find you won't need such stringent whistleblowing. But the other point I'd like to make, and, and we, we keep referring to process, and it's, it's easy to do that, but actually what we are putting in place is whistleblowing standards of which a process is just part. Um, and I'm just reflecting on um, some of the things that are actually in this set of standards and, and one of them is about recording and learning lessons. As the INWO, my organisation um, will have a duty to ensure that as far as we can we are monitoring and we are ensuring that it's not just the whistleblowing but in the way a whistleblowing complaint was looked at. Did, was there also evidence of learning? What are the organisation doing to address systemic issues as well? So that is where there's a similarity with complaint handling. But equally, um, the, the standards talk about there is a requirement to meet them. There is a requirement for, for, for boards and staff and leadership. And whilst these are only one bit of it, if you like, it's this circular thing that if you can start establishing accountability at a different level, that is another of the contributory factors towards changing the culture. But I, I, I agree, this is not going to be an overnight thing, but I think it will be a bit like a snowball that once we start this journey, we will get to a much better place quicker than if we didn't have whistleblowing standards. Well, Thank you. Um, so I think it's an excellent question, and, and, it, and it's one that it's not, uh, won't surprise you to learn, confined to the health service, you know, how do we change culture? How do we make people feel safe and supported in speaking up? Um, and I think all of the, the work that Alison's talked about um, is incredibly important in doing that, putting things in place in the organisation 
to make sure that it's got the structures to be able to encourage listening and to train managers so that they can see things um, uh, in the necessary way. And in fact, our organisation, a, a lot of what we do is to train organisations. So that's all very important. Um, but the, the one thing missing, and, it's, and I think it's an uncomfortable thing to, to come up against, but it is accountability. It is about accountability. It's about changing the incentives and the disincentives for individuals that would seek to ignore whistleblowing concerns, and they do. You know, I've seen time and time again, people will just ignore emails because they're difficult. They're hard emails to deal with. Someone's coming to you with a hard problem. All the individuals, like the, the powerful stories that you talked about, that have started to treat that individual differently. Um, and I, I think my reflections, speaking to lots and lots of people in these positions, is that it, it does on the whole come down to what are the incentives and the disincentives for them at those points. So we do need accountability, and we do need to make sure that those individuals that have done wrong are hold to, held to account for that. And I think that that does feed into this question of what are the powers available to the INWO? Um, and if we're not expecting the INWO to, to, to somehow create that accountability, then you know, are, are there other structures within society that, that we're expecting to do that? Um, so Health Improvement Scotland, we're not touched upon the, the kind of the way that they would interact, but, but somehow we need to, to, to make sure that um, it's not just the case that when something goes wrong, we all write down that it went wrong and we reflect on it, etc. Um, people need to actually have their situation changed if, 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 if they've been a wrongdoer, I think. Yeah. Um, very briefly, and then I'll bring in Brian Whittle. Yes. I re come back to something I said earlier, that these powers are additional to the powers I have as Ombudsman. And I, I understand entirely um, why there may be concerns, because I don't have binding powers. Um, I make recommendations, but they're not binding. In all the time of the Ombudsman, including my two predecessors, we've never had to exercise the powers we do have to the utmost, which is if recommendations are not complied with, we can bring the matter to Parliament. And I think that of itself is a powerful indicator of why when we make recommendations and we follow them up, that's the important thing, and the way we make recommendations are in relation to personal redress, they're in relation to learning and improvement of the service. They're also in relation to way complaints are handled. So in that context, I'm very comfortable that replicating the same way that we operate with complaints is effective. And I think it's effective because it's not binding. And that might sound contradictory, but what that gives you is a very different relationship that you can develop with organisations. So it's not about cosying up, it's not about um, being on the same side or whatever you want to call it. It's about recognising that there are occasions when sitting around a table to talk about something, and that might be your recommendations, is more effective than an adversarial situation. Um, in terms of um, other organisations, this is where I think the importance between recognising, for example, the differences between whistleblowing concerns and pure grievances is there are already provisions in law in relation to um, things like bullying, grievances, and those would be a more appropriate place. And one of the things that I think that this brings this uh, set of standards is a recognition that there is the ability to share information to get the redress to the right place. Um, and that doesn't automatically mean it will be whistleblowing. It doesn't automatically mean it would be um, down the HR grievance route. But it's important that we have enough ability between us to share the information to get the right outcome rather than the follow the process slavishly outcome. Thank you very much. Brian. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, just, just to follow on from um, what, what Anna Sauer was saying, I think for whistleblowing to be uh, uh, to be uh, uh, effective and a complaints procedure to be effective, it needs to be seen as valid. And I think, um, uh, as Anna was, uh, was alluding to there, I think a lot of management see whistleblowing currently as a threat. Um, and you've talked about accountability, though. Um, and, but to be accountable there has to be a, a certain level of uh, training and support for management right the way through uh, uh, to, the, to, to board member level. 
Jan, I wonder whether or not that you, you feel that, that that support is in place to, to support the work that you're currently doing uh, in the whistleblowing element. Or Ron Atkinson. Ron Atkinson. Um, it's a very valid point that you make in terms of accountability and um, do we support that. I would suspect that generally, no, we don't. Um, we live in a very performance-driven environment and it's very numerically driven. Um, and that tends to lead to people thinking that, that not achieving or something being wrong is bad. Something not being right, being wrong, is something you can learn from. And I think we have to drive that message through the culture. Just because somebody doesn't agree with something or understand something doesn't, isn't a reflection on them, it's a reflection on the organisation you're part of, not supporting them to learn or to grow or to develop, and for the manager to be able to help them to do that. I think management levels within the NHS are under incredible pressure as well. Um, and, and there is a tendency, and this came through in the start report as well, to, to, to almost focus on the numbers and not the story behind the numbers. Um, and I'm not arguing that we shouldn't have performance and we shouldn't have targets, but there needs to be some kind of balancing out about what can actually be achieved and taking into consideration and how do we make that a good and safe and honourable place for people to work in. And that means giving support to staff and managers to say, I don't understand this, I don't like this, and for there to be space to discuss how to move that forward. So the support is needed. Um, Emma Harper. It's kind of just a, 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 a wee sup, really, but it'd be interesting, Alison Mitchell, to hear how your 20 um, people that are supporting folk to speak up, how is that going to be monitored and measured? Because that's really interesting to hear about how we create a safe culture. And in the Sturrock review, it talked about um, there needs to be the ability to rebuild confidence in managers and a programme of action learning, training, review, coaching and support is essential. So obviously that's maybe not happening across NHS boards at the moment, but I would you obviously you would support action learning and engagement in education so that people's ability to report and flatten the hierarchy can be part of this learning absolutely the the, the new role that we've created the, the two ambassadors supported by the network of advocates we've actually taken time we've, we appointed the ambassadors last month we're waiting to be sure that the, the processes are robust in place so that when the advocates are rolled out, they can be effective in the role. And part of that, because this is a new initiative, we've been taking inspiration from the guardianship model down south, where we've had we've engaged with them and found out where the you know the, the, the real wins are to be made in having that kind of structure. Um, we will be building in as an intrinsic part of that process feedback and review to develop the service so that it isn't just um, a one-off, it'll be an organic service. And having feedback, I think Sturrock actually raises that in his report quite um, vociferously, it's very, very important to constantly review what you're doing, putting in place. There's not a one-stop one shop, I've ticked a box, I've done a training initiative, everyone's trained now that's fine. Is that training being effective? So we will be putting in a continuous improvement feedback process um, throughout through this whole exercise and already NHS Loathing, which has been subject to you know, external review quite recently in, um, in regard to waiting times, you know, unchecked or care, whatever. At the end of the day, um, there was an organisational development exercise taken, working with managers, going into that to find out what they needed. So it wasn't supposed, we didn't decide they must require. We went in there and, and as, as John Sturrock says in his report, collaboratively identified their needs and you know, worked to see what it was together we could do. So it's that kind of approach, not an imposition, but a constant monitoring, a constant review and a collaboration to make that successful. Thank you very much. Briefly, Sandra Hart. Sorry, Chair, I, I was wanting to, you're, you're, a, a more substantive question about uh, integration. I thought we'll, it. We'll come to that. We'll, we'll, come, to that, we'll come to that said. shortly. <laughs> can, can, can I just ask before before I bring in David Torrance, uh, Rosemary Agnew, you mentioned um, sharing information with organisations. Now, uh, the General Pharmaceutical Council, again in response to our consultation, suggested that it shouldn't simply be his and bodies you already share information with, such as the auditor. General, but it should also extend to 
uh, medical pro or professional regulatory bodies like themselves uh, that, that it would assist in uh, improving their, the, 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 the understanding and action by regulators uh, of professions if you were able and enabled by this order to share information with them too. Is that something on which you have a view and on which you've garnered uh, other views? Um, unsurprisingly, I have several views on this. Part, partly, it's um, any sharing you can do that enables a more collaborative way of addressing any issue is a good thing. Um, we have to balance this with rights of individuals, um, as well as um, how we uh, look at information sharing. I, I think for me there's a more fundamental issue though and it's to do with my primary legislation and something that we'd actually quite welcome a different way of information sharing because always naming individual bodies isn't necessarily the most effective way of getting the right information sharing um, because, and I think whistleblowing is likely to highlight this, the issues can be so varied that you might need different things at different times. So yes, I think it's a good thing. I think sharing information with professional bodies, to an extent, um, there are some that we can already do that with under our existing legislation if we think there is a, a, a public safety issue. Um, but I think where the information sharing would be of more benefit is on the lessons learned end of things. Because what works well for one set of professionals may well work may well for another. And to be able to share information about wider learning, like we currently do with um, the Health Improvement Scotland um, intelligence um, area, would enable us, I think, to pick up some of these issues that we've talked about in terms of organisational learning. So what have we learned in relation to an individual complaint that we might want to share wider, but because of other restrictions couldn't? So yes, good thing, but I think it's more fundamental that we probably need to look at in terms of our, my existing powers as well. So in order to enable you to share with professional regulators, the order would have to be am amended from the draft order as it currently stands. Is that your understanding? I, I think at the moment it has to name them. It's not a, a more general it's information not, uh, and sharing. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure that the order would be the most sensible place to address the wider things because they've not really been looked at and scrutinised and I wouldn't want the um, unexpected consequences effect to happen. But I do think it is an area um, not just for the NHS but generally for public sector that we, we could perhaps step back from because the SPSO Act has been in place for quite a long time now. Addressing those wider issues though would require primary legislation in relation to the SPSO Act whereas the order might enable you to share more widely with organisations. Yeah, I think the, the order, as long as it gets the right organisations in there, and as in the, you know, the right spread of them, and ultimately um, that would be a, a matter for government and we'd happily contribute to um, that. But in terms of wider information sharing, I think that's a, a longer term issue. Thank you very much. David <coughs> Collins. Thank you. Good morning, panel. How long does it typically, typically take for whistleblown concerns to be investigated internally? Who would like to offer that? Bob Matheson. Yeah, I mean, I've obviously spoken to an awful lot of people. I mean, it, how long is a piece of string? And, you know, and, and I'm not being facetious. It, it really is completely context um, dependent. Uh, uh, so I think it's uh, to build that into what we're talking about. You know, it's a big challenge of the standards to be able to reflect... Um, both that there should be some pressure on the organisation not to kick it into the long grass, which is, does happen and is a way of not dealing with these issues, but also is flexible enough so that for the particular facts of the situation, it's not putting um, completely unreasonable uh, expectations on the organisation, which, as you say you know, uh, earlier, already have day jobs. You know, some of them may have clinical duties as well. Thank you. Rona Atkinson. It all comes down to, to what is the content of the complaint. If I can reflect on something we've done in Grampian, we were concerned that we weren't recording any whistleblowing, which didn't seem right. 
Um, so we actually went back over some complaints that hadn't been handled as whistleblowing to see that if they were or they weren't. In essence, they weren't whistleblowing, but they were complaints that weren't properly handled. So we then took a backward step and went back to the people involved, everybody, and said, can we start at the beginning again and see if we can get you a better outcome? Um, and we've learned quite a lot from that. One of the things we've learned is just because something's anonymous doesn't mean to say you can't identify where in the organisation the occurrence is and find a way to be helpful. Um, we also found that if you move away from management speak language and into everyday language, it makes a big, big difference. Um, and we've also directed those areas that we went back to, we have within Grampian a thing called values-based reflection. And basically it's... Um, mediated time out for a team that's been under pressure and they sit as a team and discuss given our values and our principles as to why we are here how has today gone and what could we do to each for each other to make it better and that is spreading significantly through the organization because it allows people to bring out things that they're not happy about in the safe environment and for there be to collective agreement as to how we go forward um, so we've learned that you can't really put a time on how long it takes because it depends on what you're dealing with and sometimes you have to break away from the process and the counting of that process to focus on the individuals and the situations that they are dealing with. David Torrance. Thank you again, convener. Um, Rosemary, you mentioned it earlier that time limits are uh, flexible um, and individuals could take their case to the next step if they feel internal investigations take too long. But do you think, to save confusion, would it not be more appropriate for that 12 months time limit um, to start once a case, internal case, had been finished? Well, as in 12 month time limit for bringing for referral, yes. to us. Um, I think there's, there's probably something to add about existing powers and time limits for bringing them to uh, INWO, as will be SPSO. And that is even within my legislation, I have the flexibility to take things outside that time limit. And one of the very strong arguments that we do accept and we do take things outside time limits is often the situation of an individual or an overwhelming public interest. And I think if something had taken an organisation a length of time to look into, to address, and the individual had been content with the time that it was taking so they didn't come to us, it wouldn't automatically not get looked at simply because it wasn't 12 months. There's already the flexibility to accept those there. I think what is more likely is that this will test it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Sandra Hart. Thank you very much, Kavira, and good morning, everyone. Um, we've heard a lot about uh, culture and change, etc., and that's why I wanted to raise the issue of integration. Uh, we know, obviously, there's been a lot of changes in the services, but health service and social work uh, as well. But the, the order for the SPSO, um, basically powers and whistleblowing, only extends to the NHS. And I know that um, in the SPSO's consultation about whistleblowing, uh, they contain a section with advice to IGBs, <coughs> general reports, uh, such as signposting if things are too appropriate, um, you know, other other orders such as uh, Care Inspectorate, Audit Scotland, or even the INWO, which we are going to have in the powers of the S. I hate all, using all these bits and pieces. I know you get very confusing. I, I, I just wondered uh, what your thoughts are on that. The fact that uh, there is integration um, is difficult to cultural, as, as had been raised by Anis uh, Sarwar as well. And does the Care Inspectorate have the powers? Uh, to basically investigate the handling of whistleblowing cases and perhaps, um, probably put you on the spot, Rosemary, but perhaps uh, would there be merit in simply extending the powers to for whistleblowing in regards to social care to um, the, yourselves? Rosemary Agnew. Oh, that's a tricky question, isn't it? Um, I, I think um, in terms of extending it beyond health services, um, that's a matter for the policy makers. Um, we will do our best to always deliver a good service, whatever the scope of the powers. Uh, I think for me the issue of integration is probably not that dissimilar to some of the issues with complaint handling. And it's not a matter of who does it, it's a matter of does it get done. 
So the importance of signposting is we want to avoid people being kicked from pillar to post because they're not quite sure where. And I think that even within the draft order and within complaint handling, if people came to us for advice, um, we are very clear about um, giving them advice about where to go. And if it doesn't work, come back to us. And ultimately, if they want to raise it as a concern about how what they think is a whistleblowing concern was handled, we would. I, I think those would be quite good things to raise the issue in, to say, actually, this element is not working, that element is not working. But it's it's not whether others have the powers at this point, because obviously we're focused on this order and what it means for us. For me, the integration bit is about helping individuals get to the right place at the right time quickly. And that's where I think there is perhaps sometimes general confusion that's not just related to whistleblowing. Mm -hmm. Anybody else like to contribute? Yeah, in, uh, on a follow-up, obviously, being in the Health Committee, we've done a lot of work on integration, and it has been a difficult job with social work and health. And the reason for, for raising it is the fact that, obviously, social care, whilst they're integrated, is looked upon differently from health. And therefore, when we look at this, and if yourself, Rosemary, do get this power through this order, you would envisage, or perhaps people in local government or social care will envisage that the people who work in the health service uh, have a better service via whistleblowing than the other and local authorities do. Uh, and I wouldn't like to think that would be the case. But you're saying that the powers at the moment, that people can come to yourself, even if the new powers come forward, and whistleblowing and bypass other parts of their organisation, such as local authorities or particularly social care, they could come just straight to yourselves anyway. They come to us to bypass, but if they had concerns that they thought that they were raising something that came within the remit of whistleblowing, um, but actually was about care rather than health, that it's important that there are organisations who make sure that something happens and that that's where the signposting is important. As regards the wider issue of is it um, different levels of service, I, I think that is an argument that could apply to the whole of public service. So for the sake of the sanity of myself and my office, we have focused on health. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. And can I, uh, can I say thank you to our witnesses today? That's been extremely helpful. And uh, we will no doubt come back uh, to these issues when we come to consider the matter formally. We will, of course, be hearing in a few moments from the Cabinet Secretary and some of the points that we have uh, raised with yourselves, I'm sure we will raise with the Cabinet Secretary too, but we will suspend uh, briefly and resume in five minutes uh, with uh, new witnesses. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, and we'll now resume our meeting, and welcome to the committee, Jean Freeman, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, and Dr Stephen Lee Ross, Head of Workforce uh, Practice with the Scottish Government, um, to consider further the super affirmative instrument that we have been considering uh, this morning. Um, can I perhaps start the questions by asking the Cabinet Secretary uh, welcome and, and ask you um, about the decision that in WO, the, the role of the Independent National Whistleblowing Officer should be carried out by the Scottish Public Service Ombudsman rather than simply within that, uh, within her uh, uh, remit, but to, to combine the two posts in a single individual. Clearly, we've had, uh, we've heard this morning uh, support for that position. We've also had submissions which raise some questions about that position, uh, in particular about whether it runs the risk of whistleblowing being absorbed among many other responsibilities. And I'd be very interested to hear the Scottish Government's uh, uh, propositions on that matter. Um, <clears throat> so it seemed to uh, us very clear that the independent nature of the SPSO uh, role and office is very well established and very well respected and is an office that uh, carries considerable influence or in our public sector. Uh, so our interest then was it seemed sensible that rather than create something entirely separate with an entirely separate bureaucracy and so on and so forth, uh, was to have those conversations and discussions to see, in fact, how SPSO office and the SPSO herself uh, felt about that and whether she believed that it could be accommodated and was a fit uh, without detracting from uh, other areas of work or being subsumed in other areas of, of work. Happily, uh, the Ombudsman herself believes that this is the right place to put it. Uh, and so it, it seemed uh, to me perfectly sensible uh, place and decision to take is to say it should be in that office uh, because of its clearly established independence uh, from any part of the public sector and from government. Thank you very much. Uh, Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I raised a question earlier about the resources that would be assigned or the cost, because we don't know how busy the whistleblower is going to be, or uh, because we don't have projections at the moment. So I'm wondering what, uh, what work has been undertaken to estimate the, the likely workload or the resources that will be required. Mm -hmm. So some of that I'm going to uh, ask... Uh, Dr Lee Ross to respond to some of the detail around that because um, it is, as you say, quite, it's not straightforward to estimate what the likely uh, workload would be, but that is all part, was all part and part of the discussions with the Ombudsman uh, because obviously they want to be clear uh, that in terms of additional workload that they have the resourcing to meet that, partly also to be sure in answer to uh, the convener's question uh, that uh, one side of their or one part of their business doesn't lose out um, in terms of how it's dealt with uh, when an additional responsibility comes along. But um, perhaps you might want to do some of the detail on that. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, currently, as part of our staff governance monitoring exercise, we ask all health boards in Scotland the number of stage two whistleblowing complaints they have under their existing policy and process. That reveals currently that there is a fairly small number of cases overall. For instance, um, NHS Lothian reported they only had five cases live in the, the monitoring return um, and similar numbers abound across the piece. Uh, we absolutely recognise that um, the introduction of this function may rightly um, increase the number of individuals who seek redress through the INWO and that is that is um, a fundamentally sound proposition from that perspective. We are in active discussion with the corporate body around monitoring the likely number of cases that will will be heard, um, particularly during the transition period, and obviously have given an undertaking to meet the costs associated with that. But we do anticipate that numbers will rise among, ab above their current um, small crop. Okay. I take it from that then, I, I think you said the, that the government has given a, an undertaking to the corporate body that whatever the level of resource required, it will be met by government. And that will come from government rather than from NHS Scotland per yes, se. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian Whittle. 
you've been a good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, good morning, Dr. Lee Ross. Um, the what is the definition of what constitutes uh, whistleblowing is going to be handled by the complaints handling uh, procedures, and I wondered what consideration may be given to the fact that you'd be presenting legislation and without defining in the legislation uh, what it's meant to deliver, and we're really leaving that definition of uh, um, that legal term to the SPS. So is there a, is there a danger there? Um, I, I think the. There may be a small degree of risk there. I think there's a greater risk in doing it without uh, using the SPSO's uh, clarity around her standards that she sets. Um, there isn't actually, uh, to the best of our knowledge, we've not found uh, a UK or nationally agreed, internationally agreed definition of whistleblower. If we had found such a thing, we, we might well have used it. Um, but it seems to us to make sense to um, have the standards set by uh, SPSO uh, and for her to work from that um, on the basis that that allows uh, a more effective uh, allocation of what she's there to do. Uh, but that was the subject, again, of considerable debate and discussion. And I, again, uh, Dr Lee Ross may want to add something to what I've said. Yeah, so just, uh, I think, to pick up on that point, um, the we um, deliberately, after discussion, uh, left this matter to the, to the Ombudsman to define in the context of their model complaints handling procedure. And the reason for that, logically, is, is obviously that the, um, the definition of what might be considered uh, a whistleblowing matter, or who might therefore be considered a whistleblower, can evolve over time. Um, and we wouldn't want to arbitrarily exclude people from bringing legitimate cases uh, simply on the basis that there is a definition set on the face of legislation that excludes them, arguably, you know, unwantonly or unnecessarily so, from bringing such a complaint. Um, and in addition to that, the Ombudsman is currently consulting on the standards and her own proposed definitions. We felt that there was a measure of um, a transparency around um, what the function is, is, is going to look like in terms of who can be a whistleblower and, and, and what a whistleblowing complaint is. I think that we, had, we, we were uh, listening to evidence before. I think there is the, there was a little bit of um, nervousness from the SPS or in the fact that they're the ones that are defining uh, a, a legal term. And I think the suggestion was maybe kind of a non-exhaustive definition uh, of whistleblowing set within the legislation. And I wondered whether that, that, that's something that you'd considered. We had, we had considered that, and we'd taken advice on that point. Um, I, I suppose there is there is a, a, a legislative issue in the sense that, by definition, you don't put non-exhaustive definitions on the front of legislation, because when it comes to them being interpreted, they are interpreted exhaustively. Um, we'd also considered, you know, putting that uh, definition in terms of the, the principles, but the existing legislation only requires a single set of principles for all model complaints handling procedures that cut across the Ombudsman's jurisdiction. As such, we felt that the safest place was to allow that to be placed in the complaints handling process, model complaints handling process. If I, if I could, yeah. I, I, and the, the, what this means then is that the, the legislation will be dependent uh, on third parties who are not subject to parliamentary scrutiny. I wonder if there's any other examples of that you have that you can you can share with the, the committee. Sorry, can, can you just explain what you mean by that? Well, well the, de the definition of the legislation um, will be left to a third party uh, in this particular uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, um, situation. And that's not subject to parliamentary scrutiny. So I was wondering whether there are any other examples where this this is work this is working where a, a third party um, has has that level of of, of implement um, input into into legislation. In, in other words, ex uh, uh, leaving the definition out of the order means that it's not part of the primary of, of the legislation as such. And I think what Brian Whittle is asking for is there are are there other examples that you can offer of where such an important definition has been left for uh, the uh, pa another party to uh, uh, include in, so in subsequent provision. I, I can't think of anything offhand. Uh, what I would say is obviously the, the, the 
process that we've ch we've chosen to pursue in allowing the ombudsman to bring forward those definitions through their model complaints handling process is commensurate with the process that is undertaken for the ombudsman to exercise any of its other complaints handling functions. One thing we did take advice on, as, as I raised slightly early, earlier, was the risk of arbitrarily or potentially accidentally excluding folk from being able to, to, to bring a complaint. And it's, it's logical if we're giving the ombudsman the capacity to set what the model complaints handling procedure is, that they then determine whether or not um, a, a complaint is, is sound on the basis that they have discretionary authority to take that complaint forward. Okay. I'm, I'm still, I'm still uh, perhaps like Mr. Whittle, still a bit concerned about the nature of the answers we've had on this point of, of, of where the definition should lie. I think, Stephen Lee Ross, you said that uh, a non-exhaustive definition shouldn't be included in legislation because it might be exhausted. But I, I can think of many examples uh, of where legislation uh, says uh, such and such shall include but shall not be confined to. And that's, that's quite a standard provision in law, is it not, uh, for matters of this kind? Well, certainly, you're right, convener, in, the, in as much as I have seen that elsewhere. Um, but I think the logic of, of the position we've taken is exactly as uh, Dr. Lee Ross has outlined. That seemed to us to be the correct approach, given what the Ombudsman is there to do, given how other matters are dealt with by the Ombudsman, is to proceed in this fashion. Okay, one last point, question on this point from Brian. Just, just, just you know, from, from own, my own uh, understanding here is that what we're suggesting here is this, that we're not, you would not put um, a non-exhaustive definition into legislation. And my understanding is that the SBSO definition will be non-exhaustive. So I don't quite understand why it's all right for them to sit with a non-exhaustive definition, but we can't sit with that within legislation. Stephen Lee Roth. Uh, the discretionary authority we've given the Ombudsman is, is, is precisely to allow them to, uh, for the, the definition to evolve over time. And I think the point is that it more readily does that in the context of that complaints handling process than it does on, on, on the face of, of the order. Okay, thank you very much. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, Camina. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary, and good morning, Dr. Lee Ross. Um, we had obviously the Ombudsman in for you, and I ask, I'll ask you the same question I started with her, and that is that uh, policy change is only as good as the difference that it makes. And given that we are still all absorbing the um, findings and the recommendations of the historic review into NHS Highland, are you confident that things would have been different had this change been in effect before? things got bad in NHS Highland? Um, well, well I, I think I'd make a couple of points in response to that. I think, for me, the Stark report is actually about a great deal more than whistleblowing. Uh, it is about a workplace culture um, that was operating poorly to the extent that, in particular, four individuals felt uh, compelled to raise their concerns publicly. Um, had this uh, been in place, then it may well have been that they would have raised that through this office. Um, but uh, that doesn't detract from the fact of what compelled it to be raised in the first place. Uh, so where this may be uh, advantageous is where you have individuals. It, it's a hard thing to do to raise such a matter in a public fashion uh, and to then cope with the personal exposure that that brings. And it takes a degree of personal confidence and resilience to do that. I don't want it to be the case that individuals have to have sufficient personal confidence and resilience in order to raise matters in this way. So I think this office provides that uh, safer route by which to do it. But it is, of course, just one part of the overall jigsaw in terms of whistleblowing, and the other element of that will be the directly appointed whistleblowing champions uh, attached to each board who have a much more focused local role, uh, uh, almost as advocates uh, at that level, and who are directly accountable to the minister. 
Thank you for that. The Ombudsman um, made a, a really interesting point about the distinction between the role of a, uh, the whistleblowing function and normal HR grievance procedures. And for example, if we go back to NHS Highland, bullying ostensibly should be swept up in HR processes and grievances. It's not about a, a national systemic issue. But there are occasions when bullying is a symptom of a, a wider systemic problem. Um, and staff, I think, need to have the confidence that if that is the case, that they can circumvent local HR procedures and go straight to the top. Are you confident that all staff, firstly, will know that they can do that? And secondly, be able to do that? So there are, there are a number of um, uh, elements in play at the minute. Uh, so we have this uh, piece of, of legislation to establish the Independent National Whistleblowing Office. We have the continuation of the helpline. We have the appointment uh, direct to uh, accountable to ministers of the whistleblowing champions. And we also have uh, the important piece of work, which is the uh, refreshing of this as an HR policy, uh, amongst other HR policies, on the basis of what's described as a once for Scotland. In other words, it's a policy that will apply across all health boards to all staff and not be open to individual interpretation by different boards, uh, which is actually um, quite a significant step forward and will be on a, a number of HR policies. Um, in all of those circumstances, there needs to be uh, a parallel piece of work which involves ensuring that all staff are um, informed of their rights and their responsibilities as employees, as uh, workers in our health service uh, and uh, and know where to go and what to do um, if they have concerns, either individually in their own employment in terms of um, uh, how that affects them or other concerns uh, perhaps around an area of practice or what they believe is practice that is not being uh, undertaken as well as it should be uh, that impacts on patients or others. Um, so all of that, making sure we get all of that right, is, is as, almost as important as all these other elements that we're doing so that people know how to operate the system. Um, but there will always be the backstop, if you like, of the helpline and the uh, independent national whistleblowing officer to go to um, when people are unsure or don't feel that it is... Um, that they feel comfortable in pursuing the local policies. Thank you. Anna Sarver. Cabinet Secretary, uh, I welcome everything you, you've just said there and I agree wholeheartedly with it. But the reality is we can have the best processes in place, the best mechanisms in place. We can have all the whistleblowing guardians and champions we like. If the culture is wrong and the trust doesn't exist, um, given how small a place Scotland is and even how small a place Scotland's NHS is, it's not going to work. What, what are we going to do to change that culture and build that trust? Mm -hmm. <coughs> so so I think you're absolutely right about that. And actually, um, whilst I, uh, I'm keen that we get all the policies and processes right and that people understand them both on whistleblowing but also in, uh, if you like, standard HR policies around grievance and so on, we get all of that right and we involve all the unions and the appropriate representative bodies in uh, doing that. Um, the degree to which they are used will be, for me, the degree to which we either are successful or not successful in changing that culture and ensuring that it is one where people feel um, able to raise concerns uh, and are listened to and heard uh, and those concerns are acted on, even if the acting on them is to uh, reach a view that the concerns aren't legitimate. Um, so there are a number of things that we're looking at doing. One of those is um, what I said when we published the Sturrock report, which is to bring together uh, all the uh, leadership bodies, if you like, inside our health service. That includes all our rural colleges, our regulatory bodies, uh, our boards, um, our unions, um, to look at the role that each of us can play in um, creating and promoting that positive workplace culture. Some of the Royal Colleges, as you probably know, are already taking steps themselves 
Royal College of Surgeons, for example, is running its own uh, work called Cut It Out, which is around how uh, surgeons as clinicians and with their more junior members of the team, um, how they behave uh, and the kind of working relationships that they promote. Um, part of it also links directly to our patient safety programme. Um, some of the, the work inside the patient safety programme does positively encourage the raising of concerns and the, but via a, a route of checking that everything is okay before you start, for example, a particular procedure, the safety pause in emergency departments and so on. Um, the other part of the work will be the wellbeing summit, uh, which is again part, partly around this, but it is also looking at issues of mental wellbeing and stress and so on in the workplace and what specifically do we need to do. Uh, and we will look outside of the health service. So, for example, uh, NATS, uh, National Air Traffic Control Service, um, have now got themselves to a position where uh, they uh, have achieved a culture inside NATS where uh, mistakes and near misses are regularly reported, discussed and acted upon to the extent that people will report themselves for a mistake that they recognise they've made or a near miss. Now, I'm really keen to know what did Nats do to get from where they were to that place because there is a comparator there with what we're doing. The Nats example is an interesting one in the context, for example, the, the Bawa Garba case where people can identify self-mistakes, reflection, and <coughs> therefore not pay a, a price for it. I think we've got a long way to go in the National Health Service in terms of admitting mistakes because mistakes have consequences and, and sadly we live in a, in a blame culture so that makes it much harder in NHS setting. And what you said earlier on, clearly there's an issue around independence and anonymity, particularly in, in the closed working spaces, so how you overcome that anonymity and independence when the people you're working with every single day are the ones you've got to report incidences to and that impacts on your everyday working life, impacts on your career progression, so how we build that anonymity and independence is really important. But also, we all accept that pressure on staff is rising. Our staff are telling us that when you've got more and more pressure and you have less and less free time, how can you have that building of understanding and that ability to raise concerns if you just don't have, simply don't have the time? Well, if you look at something like the surgical pause and the safety pause in the emergency departments, that is about uh, making the time to ensure that everything is safe before we proceed. And everything being safe is also about everybody in your team being safe. Um, so there is a, an element of all of this, which is about focusing on what is safe and effective for patients and using that to ensure that your team is safe. And that where people have concerns that, you, you can, that there's, there's a space to raise those. Now, that is really, at its core, are all about leadership. And it's, it's partly leadership at, at the most senior level, but it is leadership at tiers down as well, across clinicians, but across every other uh, element of the workforce in our health service. And so one of the things, we have a very successful, I'm sure you know, Project Lift um, leadership programme, but I'm really keen to ensure that we are making sure that that is delivered at every single level from basic supervisory right through our health service because it is there that you find people responding to pressure um, in a way that, that doesn't open up the opportunity for somebody to say, yeah, I'm going to do that, but before I do, can I just point out that's not right over there, whatever that might be whether that is the cleaning room that has been closed and therefore we can't change the water, right, for uh, us as domestics through to, you know, the theatre where not all the instruments are where they need to be. I accept all that again, but in the real world of what, what's happening is, do you accept that we, we've got to work harder to care for those that care for us? And whilst doing that, also accept that there are people being bullied and intimidated every single day across our National Health Service in terms of the workforce in every health board across the country every single day. And therefore, this should be a national priority for us in standing up for NHS staff to, to change that culture and build trust. So I think I've already made it clear that the, the mental well-being as well as the physical well-being of our NHS staff is important to me. 
and that is what we are actively looking at. I also think it is clear that it is a priority for me, but I need to be really clear too that promoting a positive workplace culture and seeing uh, some of the key changes that we need to see is done against a context where the majority of our staff are still reporting to us that they have confidence in raising concerns, that they, do, they are not fearful about raising those concerns, uh, but where we need to make the positive changes to promote that culture is not something we're going to achieve quickly. You don't change uh, the largest employer in Scotland uh, across the length and breadth of this country with such a wide range of jobs to do. You do not um, shift that forward in a, in a positive way overnight. So uh, all of the areas that I've talked about uh, combine, in my opinion, to take us forward in that. But that doesn't mean that we've thought of everything. Thank you very much. Brian then Emma Hart. Thank you, community. Just uh, following on from uh, what Anna Sal was saying, that I think for whistleblowing to, to be uh, effective, it has to be accepted uh, as a valid process uh, by management. I think I think we'd all accept just now currently that, that in many cases um, it, it's seen as a threat. Uh, really, really to management. So we've talked a lot, or we heard a lot in the last session around accountability. Uh, but to make people accountable, I would suggest you have to make sure they have uh, the support and training available to them to, to make them uh, accountable. So sitting alongside uh, this legislation of whistleblowing, what, what are the plans, therefore, to, to, to create that? that to, we talk about a learning environment and we want to learn from our mistakes. I think the reality is, as we know, that that's, we're not in that place at the moment with our health service. So what do we need to do? in terms of support management, and I'm, I mean from board level down, to accept whistleblowing as, 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 a, as a valid process? So, so that before I answer the question in full, and uh, Dr Lee Ross might want to add some more detail to what I'm going to say, I, I'm, I'm not prepared to accept that across our health service, all management do not accept whistleblowing as a positive area. Um, there are undoubtedly places where people feel threatened by it, uh, and that's an issue that we've got to tackle. And nor do I accept that we talk a lot about learning lessons but don't learn very many of them, because I think we do. Um, and what I said to Mr Sarwar about leadership, you know, quality leadership training is about recognising what responsibility and accountability are and how to promote that in your team that you are leading as well as in yourself. And therefore, to see... People raising concerns, complaints, um, worries about practice, about behaviours, are opportunities to continuously improve. That's quite hard for folks to come to terms with sometimes because it can feel, um, it can feel personal, it can feel threatening. Um, but, but quality leaders recognise it for what it is an opportunity to improve the working practice of a team, whatever that team is doing. So the, so the area I'm talking about when I talk about leadership training at every level in our health service is about promoting that accountability and responsibility and helping people understand that for what it is. Now, at board level and at chief exec level and chair level, then there, there are a range of... of uh, opportunities for people to be supported in that regard. The uh, Director in, of Health inside local government, inside Scottish government rather, um, uh, actively provides additional resources, uh, as we are doing at the moment, for example, to NHS Highland, uh, to help that board, its chair and chief exec, take forward the recommendations of the Sturrock report, which for many will be a, a painful exercise in reading what that report said but then leading the improvement that's needed in that area. Now, Dr. Lee Ross may have some more detail to add to what I've said. Yeah, so I suppose in, in, uh, in the context of specific initiatives that we're working on um, to deliver, um, I suppose, training in the, the field of whistleblowing, we took the <laughs> conscious decision with the Ombudsman, in discussion with the Ombudsman, that uh, following the legislation coming into force, there would be a six-month implementation period through which ourselves, the Scottish Government, the Ombudsman, uh, and the Ombudsman would work with health boards uh, on getting them to understand 
the, the, the whistleblowing standards and understand fundamentally the, the, the context in which our revised whistleblowing policy sits. Um, and, and basically to engender uh, the, the point that you just made around um, recognizing that whistleblowing uh, in some instances is, is a, you know, it's, it's a good thing, it's a supportive thing, it's something that uh, allows us to recognize that something has gone wrong and correct it. In addition to that, we will also be um, undertaking a specific training and implementation program when we um, publish the revised Once for Scotland uh, workforce policies. Um, and that training program will take in leaders at all levels. We recognise that leadership within the health service is very diffuse um, and that we need to be capturing people at all levels across our service. I, just, I, I accept, accept what you say, uh, Cabinet Secretary, and, and, and the, the direction of travel you want to take, but the fact of the matter, we have the start review. We have the issue uh, in Ayrshire and Ireland at the moment where we have nearly 100 radiographers signing a letter saying there's a problem. And I would suggest to you that when issues come to MSPs, we are a last resort. And I think all of us have issues, uh, are dealing with issues at the moment. So not to underplay this, Cabinet Secretary, you, you know, the bottom line is we do have to support management in terms of helping to deal, uh, helping them to deal with the issue of whistleblowing. That's the point I was making. I think you're absolutely right, because I think, so I don't disagree with you in that at all, Mr Whittle, and I think that um, some of the issues that end up as whistleblowing issues uh, end up in that place because um, in uh, earlier stages they have not been responded to appropriately by uh, supervisors, managers, colleagues, whatever. Um, and so uh, people get to a point where they blow the whistle because they're, they feel they're not getting anywhere else. And okay, thank you. I'm a hub. Thank you, Convener. Um, just a, to bring back a point of what Anna Sarwar was saying, I don't accept there is a, a national blame culture in the NHS um, because I've participated in team work and multidisciplinary team approaches as a former nurse educator with um, consultants and uh, surgeons and anaesthetists and everybody listening exercises, communication exercises. But I do accept there are people who have had issues and I've got constituents myself who have came to me as potentially a last resort, which is what Brian Whittle is describing. So I welcome the education that will be provided to leadership because that was one of the things that you know, as a former nurse educator who is involved in this, it's it's great to see that we have a um, an emphasis on supporting leadership to provide education. So, I'm interested to know if how will the the office of the national whistleblower uh, work with national whistleblowing champions or other leadership? How do they work together in the future? And as the education is being provided for leadership. Is that something that NES would take forward, or Health Improvement Scotland, or is this part of just supporting a collaborative approach across the whole board? Okay, so I'll let um, Dr Lee Ross answer your question about how the education element goes in the various parts of NHS um, that uh, will contribute to that. Um, as a general point, though, I think that um, whilst I completely accept what you say, I think we we need to recognise uh, realistically that the, the NHS as a, as a service doesn't operate in isolation from the wider uh, polity and public of Scotland. And there can be, and we've all seen it, a tendency to want to blame someone in the NHS when something goes wrong. Um, blame is very different from accountability. And... I think we have a res we all collectively have a responsibility to consistently be really clear about accountability as opposed to blame. Um, and inside our health service, it's why when I answered Mr Whittle, I talked about accountability and responsibility. Um, managers have accountability uh, to varying degrees depending on where in that ladder you are. Uh, but so too do employees for what they do, and everyone has that collective responsibility. Um, in terms of where all of this sits and the uh, board level whistleblowing champions, their job is at board level, is inside that health board, to ensure that uh, a number of things are happening. First of all, that the 
the uh, standard HR policies and processes are working, then they're a place for people to go if they feel that's not happening. So, you know, I raised an issue and I've got nowhere. I raised an issue and it's weeks and nobody's said anything. I raised an issue and suddenly they're not talking to me. Or I raised an issue and here's how it worked out and it was good. So if we can do that over there in that department, can we not do it over here in that department? And that's their focus. Their focus is at board level. Um, the uh, national, independent national whistleblowing champion is of, is of a different stripe, if you like. That's when people feel that they have exhausted all of this and they haven't got anywhere and they now want to take it further and have that independent office uh, with their uh, powers of investigation and so on and so forth really take this issue forward. So the, 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 um, up until now, the uh, whistleblowing champion role at board level has been um, an additional responsibility for our existing non-executive board member. Um, what we will do is make it a discrete, it's a, it's a specific role. Now they will have other responsibilities as a non-exec, they're a board member, so they have a accountability and a responsibility on that board. But their focus is on ensuring that um, inside their board, the policies and procedures are working, but very importantly, that relationships are working so that people see the value of being able to listen to and hear properly uh, concerns and issues that are being raised. So in that respect, once they're all in place and uh, all of that is running, then they have a role in that positive workplace culture as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Can I bring it to a specific... Oh, certainly on education. Um, uh, so just in, in terms of the education and training point, we again, we made the conscious decision that the new whistleblowing champions will come on stream at the point at which we're entering that six-month implementation period with the Independent National Whistleblowing Officer. And that is, is to allow um, the, the whistleblowing champions, obviously, to become au fait with, with the standards and principles and to act from, from before day one as, as an advocate within their own health board. The Scottish Government will work with the SPSO um, in terms of, of the delivery of that, that training and implementation um, and again has given an undertaking in terms of the resources that that will require. Uh, when it comes to tr implementing our revised suite of workforce policies, we will be working directly with NHS Education for Scotland who have some specialist expertise around many aspects of our existing core suite of workforce policies on the implementation phase of, of that programme. Thank you very much. Uh, there is a specific provision in the uh, or in the draft order to allow uh, SPSO or the INWO in to share information with an, a number of bodies besides the one which the ones which SPSO already can do. Uh, for example, Health Improvement Scotland. Uh, one of the submissions that we received from the General Pharmaceutical Council suggested that that list might be extended to include the health professional regulators uh, for mutual benefit in terms of addressing and improving standards. I wonder what the government's view might be of that suggestion. Um, yes, Seems absolutely enough. something we consider as part of the consultation process. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you're not, you're not, you don't have a firm view one way or the other at this stage, you're prepared well, to consider the advantages. I think the advantages. probably a wee bit more positively, um, we would not be averse to that and we'd welcome just looking exactly at um, what the rationale for it that might be, but I can see uh, why those uh, regulatory bodies would find it value in having information shared back with them from the independent uh, whistleblower. Thank you very much. Uh, David Torrance, did you want to? Thank you, Convener. Um, good afternoon, Cabinet Secretary and Dr Lee Ross. A 12 uh, month referral uh, limit. We've heard evidence this morning that there's flexibility about that, but would it not be more appropriate for it to kick in? And start once an internal investigation had finished. So, to start the, the twelve call, months, if you like, yes, for that twelve months referral time to start. Actually, once an internal investigation of a complaint had been finished. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, certainly. So obviously the, the existing 12-month time limit is is a provision within the the SPSO Act itself and governs all complaints, not all complaints handling processes, not just whistleblowing complaints. Um, 
we, given that the Ombudsman has discretionary authority to consider a case out with those time limits, um, we think it's valuable really to, to, to allow the existing provision to stand on the basis that um, you shouldn't be encouraging boards to unnecessarily take their time to conclude internal processes. We will be wanting boards to conclude their processes in line with the <coughs> recommended time limit set out in the whistleblowing standards. And also, we need to think realistically about the ability of the Ombudsman to effectively investigate when significant time periods of time has elapsed and potentially the evidence around the complaints that have been made has degraded. So given the discretionary position that the Ombudsman can take in terms of taking a, claim, a case complaint out, of, out with those limits. Um, we don't think it fundamentally would need revisiting at this stage. Thank you. There is discretion, but there is a choice as to when to start the clock running, and, and um, is there a reason for picking the earlier point rather than the later one? Well, I, I think, as Dr Lee Ross has said, one, there is a matter of consistency. Um, but um, probably uh, as it, if not more important is um, we, we don't want to run the risk that at a board level uh, a significant amount of time is taken so that by the time um, if, it, if the clock starts at the end of the in local process if you like and that local process has itself taken a year that then there is another year uh, that, that seems too long for individuals to be waiting. And, and the standards and the model policy um, should all require, will all require, boards to deal with these matters um, quickly, but fairly, but quickly. Because one of the areas that is, that is there when people are frustrated by local processes is the length of time that it feels to them it takes unnecessarily so. Um, and they don't feel they have re early resolution to their concerns. But maintaining it within a context of discretion. Yeah, but allowing, allowing the uh, INMO to, to have that discretion yeah. uh, to, take a different, to take a different view. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Sandra Hart. Thank you very much, Convener, and good morning. Um, I, I was interested in the integration part of it. We've talked about mm. culture, uh, training, etc. Mm. And we know that integration of health and social care is a huge issue, particularly with culture as well. And the powers or the projected powers that the, you know, the ombudsman is, is going to have is basically just based on the health service. And I know that through the consultations we put out, <clears throat> they speak to the, well, they mention to the IGBs that they follow the, the process. And they can be signposted to the Care Commission or, or to Scotland even. Now, I just wonder, well, actually, the straight questions I asked earlier on, do you think the Care Commission have sufficient powers to cover the same as what the Ombudsman may have. Uh, do you think it would be a good idea if uh, the, for social work would be actually put in along with the whistleblower? So I'll just put it to you in that, that point. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I think I understand mm. um, th th there is on the surface of it a logic to uh, saying that w we should extend it to health and social care. Of course, Health and social care provision at local level under the IJB involves our local authorities. Mm -hmm. um, and um, this, this is not uh, something that we could then impose right, on, uh, on them. Um, that doesn't mean it can't be something that is in, in due time discussed with them uh, with a view to how it might be extended, but it would need to fit as well with individual and collective local authorities, HR policies and processes. So there, there would be a, 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 an, an accommodation needed hmm. in order to ensure that that happened. But we, we have deliberately uh, ensured that this extends to primary care. So uh, in terms of the <coughs> role of primary care in delivering health and social integration, so you're right, it covers health hmm. in its entirety. Uh, I think it's also sensible, so we've not closed our minds to this, but I think it is not... Um, uh, it's not. This is not the time, right, to include this without a lengthy discussion with local authorities. Um, so it seems sensible to introduce this now for the health service and continue those that discussion with COSLA and their members, but also to allow this to uh, <coughs> play out and see how 
uh, the care inspector and Triple SC actually um, uh, feel about their interrelationship with the independent national whistleblowing officer and uh, whether or not they want to raise with us uh, an extension uh, of either their role or an extension of this office into health and social care and how that then sits with their respective roles. Thank you very much. That's a Thank you. On that last point, is there a is there a time frame for making that judgment in your mind, or is it simply see it, see how it goes? Well, I th I think given the time frame we've got at the moment for introducing um, uh, this office for the local whistleblowing uh, appointed champions, uh, the consultation on uh, by the uh, SPSO themselves, so. We're probably looking at uh, seeing this really start to play out properly. Um, I think I'm right towards the back end of this year, the early part of next year. And I think probably um, at some point from the middle of next year on, we would at least uh, have those discussions starting with uh, local authorities to see uh, how, they, how they felt that was playing out and what they might want to do. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And, and Sandra, do you have a final a, a point? I'm happy with you're, that. You're answer, happy with thank that. you. Finally, Cabinet Secretary, what's the prize for getting this right? What will the, the impact on, on patients, on staff and on services of getting this right in the way that you've described today? Well, I, I think fundamentally having a positive uh, workplace in our health service where people feel um, able and safe and respected to raise concerns is goes straight to... Uh, continuing to improve patient safety in our health service. I think the, the two are uh, intrinsically linked. Um, and I believe that introducing the independent National Whistleblowing Office is a further step it's of its own. Uh, it's not the silver bullet, but it is one of a number of steps that we're taking to give people an assurance uh, of that safe place where they can raise matters if they've not uh, secured the resolution locally but the, the core, that has to be an element, the core of which is exactly what Mr Sarwa was talking about uh, and indeed uh, others around uh, relationships, leadership and the quality uh, of workplace culture. Thank you very much and can I thank you for your uh, contribution to our consideration today and uh, uh, look forward to seeing the order in its final form coming forward later this year. Thank you very much. We will now... Uh, uh, suspend, uh, suspend to allow witnesses to leave and then resume in a few moments in private session. <laughs>